For the last two Sundays, I have been endeavoring to preach some on what the Bible has to say about the church of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't preach the church. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. But have a good, a good Bible understanding of the church and what it is and what its function is, I think is very important to all of us. Um, I want to begin this morning by noticing a passage with you in the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21. Now unto him, that is unto Christ, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. One reason the church is so important to all of us is because in the church, Jesus Christ receives all the glory. Unto him be glory in the church. And that's what we're hoping will happen here this morning, and I trust it has been occurring as we've sung these beautiful hymns to his glory and to his praise. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, Amen. So if you and I want Jesus Christ to have the glory, then the church should be very important to us because it is in the church that he gets all the glory. It's not at political rallies. It's not at sports events. It's not at concerts. But it's in the church that he gets all the glory. And if you love him and you want him to be glorified in this earth, then the church should be very precious to you and very important to you. Now, the Bible <clears throat> has a lot to say about the church. And I believe the Bible presents the church in two phases. There is what we refer to sometimes as the triumphant church. And also, the Bible presents what we would call the militant or the military aspect of the church. The church triumphant would be all of God's elect family out of all nations and families and kindreds of the earth that Jesus died for on the cross, and they triumphed in him over death, hell, sin, and the grave. And the church today, the the, the the great body of Christ, the elect family, has experienced triumph, glory uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. How many of us love to sing victory in Jesus? <laughs> well, I'm glad to tell you that his family, the church, experienced victory at Calvary because he met the enemy, the devil, in sin, and by himself, he conquered the enemy. And he conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. And today, all of his children are triumphant in him. <clears throat> and that church body is an innumerable host, the Bible says, that no man can number. A great multitude <clears throat> that no man can number. However, the church presents also <clears throat> the church in its military state on this earth, and, and Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, tells the church to put on the whole armor of God. Why would you put on armor? Because there's a fight. And uh, we're to fight the good fight of faith. Did you know there's a good fight in this world? It's not the kind of fights we got in as kids. But it's, there's a good fight as we fight the good fight of faith and put on the whole armor of God. <clears throat> and the church, the, 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 as, the military aspect of the church today is a small group of people. It's not this large number that's going to heaven, <clears throat> but it's those who have become true disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we have these two aspects of the church presented to us in the Bible. 
Uh, and we believe that the church that Jesus built is still in the world today. You may say, well, pastor, how could that be? That's been 2,000 years ago. All the great empires have come and gone. Uh, Babylon, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, all those great mighty empires with wealth and armies have come and gone. How can the little church of Jesus still be in the world today? Well, we, we know Jesus said this in Matthew 16, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, in that statement, Jesus is giving us a prophetic view of the future of the church, and he's saying that though the devil would like to prevail against the church, he will not be able to destroy the church. Last Sunday, we noticed that the church is not limited to any particular geographical location. You know, people talk about going to the Holy Land. I was blessed to go to what is what I call the Bible Lands back in 1970, and uh, I saw a lot of bullet holes. <laughs> you know, they've had a lot of wars over there. I don't think you could really call the Bible Lands the Holy Land. The church today is holy, it's set apart unto God. But the church is not identified by any geographical location, not by any particular building or temple made by men. It's not to be identified by any particular race of people. It's certainly not identified with any one personality. But the church that Jesus built has been in the world for 2,000 years, and it has survived a lot of difficult uh, times in this world. Now we know what the church looked like in the first century because the Bible is full of letters written to churches. The, 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 uh, the book of Romans was written to the church at Rome. The Ephesian letter was written to the church at Ephesus. The Galatian letter was written to the churches of Galatia. The Corinthian, first and second Corinthians, was written to the church in Corinth. The seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation were written to the seven churches of Asia. So we get a pretty good Bible idea of what the church was like in the first century and what the church believed and what the church stood for. And we also see that those churches had many problems. Satan was coming against them, trying to destroy them in the first century. And as you read Romans and Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians and, and, and Philippians and Colossians uh, and Thessalonians, you'll find out that those dear people had a lot of problems they had to deal with in the first century. A pastor some years ago called me up and said, Brother Sam, I'm thinking about giving up the ministry. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, because there's just so many problems in the church today. <laughs> and I said, well, have you read the New Testament lately? And he said, why, what's that got to do with anything? <laughs> I said, well, the churches of the first century had a lot of problems. Did they quit? No. We don't quit just because the church has a lot of problems. We look to God to help us to work through those attacks of Satan. And those manifestations of the flesh that show up in the church sometimes. And so, yes, the New Testament is full of really very good letters written to the churches of the first century. But what, how do we know what the church looked like in the sixth century, during the Dark Ages? You know, historians call the period of history in Europe from 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D. the Dark Ages. It was like the human race just kind of went into uh, a dormant time. There were no new inventions, no discoveries, no explorations. You had, you had uh, pe the lifespan of people in those days was like 35. There was no discoveries in medicine. Now there could have been some exceptions, but as a whole, the world, the human family stood still for a thousand years, and it's called the Dark Ages. Did the church die out during the dark ages? No. 
But we don't have historical writings to tell us about how the church was during the Dark Ages. So how do we know what the church looked like in the 6th century or the 8th century or the 10th century? Well, we know that the true church was standing for the true doctrine and practice and discipline and government of God's word through those centuries. We know that. Not because we have the writings of men, the historical writings of men to tell us, but because of God's word, Jesus said the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And Paul said to the Ephesians, Now unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus until the devil destroys it, <laughs> until it dies out. No, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That tells me the church is going to be in the world throughout all ages until the end of time. And how we do rejoice in that. And we want it to be right here at Vestavia and in Birmingham, Alabama. The church has died out in different parts of the world. For as I know, the seven churches of Asia finally died out. And the great church in Rome and the great church uh, in Corinth and the great church in Ephesus, they all died out. But the church would, would, would rise up in other parts and continue on. Now, <clears throat> the church is the called out of God, people that God is calling out by his grace. And they're obedient to that call and they become active members of the local churches of Jesus Christ throughout the world. And how we do rejoice today that the church is still in the world today. You may say, well, pastor, what is the purpose of the church is the purpose of the church to help God populate heaven is the church God's means of saving the lost from hell to heaven today no Jesus did that on the cross God sent his son into this world to save his people from their sins he didn't send the church to do that Jesus did that right by himself on the cross, and we give him all the glory today for our eternal salvation. So you may say, well, what is the purpose of the church? Well, let's turn over to Paul's letter in, to Timothy, a young preacher of the first century. And Paul says to Timothy, beginning in verse uh, 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, but if I tarry long... Paul was wanting to visit with Timothy. He loved Timothy. He wanted to be with Timothy. But he was not just free to go anywhere he liked. He was at this time probably in prison for preaching the gospel. So he knows he won't be able to get out and go visit his young friend Timothy, his brother in Christ, immediately. But he said, if I tarry long... I'm writing you this letter that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Paul is telling this young brother, Timothy, you need to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. We're to behave ourselves in the church. Does anybody today not know what the word behave means? When I used to leave home as a, little, as a young boy and my mama and my daddy said, now, Sammy, you behave. I knew what they were talking about. <laughs> I was a little kid, but I got it. I understood it. Don't pretend you don't know what it means to behave, folks. <laughs> and Paul is telling Timothy, I want you to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth. So the church is on earth today. One of its functions is to help God's children to behave themselves in the house of God. And then notice what Paul said. He said, uh, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. That's P-I-L-L-A-R. Do y'all get that? It's not P-I-L-L-O-W. Last Sunday afternoon, Brother Josh was going to be preaching for us in the afternoon, and 
And Brother Josh asked uh, Brother O.C. McDade, who is 95 years old, said, are you going to stay for the afternoon? And Brother O.C. said, yes, and I can sleep just as good at church as I can at home. <laughs> well, unfortunately, there's more truth than humor in that. A lot of people go to sleep at church. I heard about a preacher one time who dreamed he was preaching, and he woke up, and sure enough, he was. <laughs> He'd gone to sleep in his own sermon. <laughs> well... Folks, Paul, didn't, he, he, he's not saying God is giving us a pillow to lay down on. It's a pillar to hold up, right? When something is on a pillar, it's held up high where people can see it. And the church is to be the pillar of the truth of Jesus Christ. The truth is a precious and valuable part of the New Testament church. What would the church be without the truth? What, we, what would we have to offer God's children if we didn't have the truth? And Paul says that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The truth is very important. Truth matters in the house of God. Thank you. Somebody said amen. It does. Truth matters. And Paul is saying to Timothy, the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And uh, that's one of the functions of the New Testament church, to preserve the truth of the gospel. I believe Jesus Christ preached his own everlasting gospel when he was here in the world. And I believe he deposited that true gospel into the true church. And one of the obligations of the church of Jesus Christ is to protect that gospel and to love that gospel. And to teach that gospel. You see, uh, let, let's go over to another passage of scripture that Paul gives to uh, the young preacher Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul again, the old preacher, is writing to the young preacher. And notice what he says. Beginning, we'll start in verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Thou therefore my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He's writing to Timothy, who was a young man and apparently was timid by nature. And he was troubled with fear. Haunting fear bothered him. And he was sometimes evidently tormented by fear. And Paul tells Timothy, he said, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Well, if, you don't, if God doesn't give us the spirit of fear, and you have a spirit of fear today, where do you think it came from? It came from the devil. Now, it's one thing to be fearful at times. It's another thing to have a spirit of fear on you that torments you and bothers you and robs you of your peace and your freedom and your joy in the Lord. And Paul tells this young brother Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And now Paul is writing to this young brother, who obviously, as a young man, struggles sometimes with fear. And uh, Paul told him one time, let no man despise thy youth. Young preachers sometimes struggle because they're young and they don't feel confident and they don't feel competent and they just don't feel like they're ready for the task. Timothy's a young man. Paul tells him, don't let any man despise your youth. God can call a young man and enable him to preach just like he can call an old man. But Paul is reminding Timothy where his strength comes from. Thou therefore my son. He's not his son biologically, but he's his son in the ministry. And Paul says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's where we get our strength, isn't it? We get our strength from the Lord. And Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now watch verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Let's look here just a moment at this chain of succession that Paul gives to Timothy. Uh, first of all, he says, and the things that thou hast heard of me. In other words, Timothy, Timothy, you and I have spent a lot of time together. I have taught you the word of God. I've taught you the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and the things that thou hast heard of me the, uh, among many witnesses. Let me tell you, beloved, the church is not a secret organization. Paul, what Paul taught Timothy was among many witnesses, right? The church has never fellowshiped secret orders of any kind, whatever the secret order might be, whether it's the Ku Klux Klan or the Freemasons or anybody else. We don't have secrets in the house of God. What we teach, we teach openly for all to hear and see. And so Paul, he's not over here in the corner whispering to somebody, some some secret thing he's come up with himself. No, Paul says, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. What I teach here from this pulpit is what I ought to be teaching privately in the home, right? We don't have secrets in the house of God. Paul said to the young brother, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The, you got to watch out for the, for the termites, folks. <laughs> The woodpeckers aren't going to do us much damage. You can hear them. It's those quiet termites can, that can hurt the church as they quietly begin to teach things that are unsound. That's a very important point, and I, I hope you'll make a note of that. So Paul is saying, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same, not a version of them, or a perversion of them, but the same things commit thou to who? Faithful men. That's what we need in the church. And that's what we need in the ministry. Faithful men. Men who are not in this for themselves. Men who love God. And they want to be faithful to God and faithful to the church and faithful to the word of God. God didn't call me to come up with my own gospel. He didn't call me to come up with a new truth. He called me to be faithful to that which I have learned as the church has handed down the gospel through the centuries. Do y'all get that? And the same things, he says, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same. See, the, the churches of Galatia were coming up with a perversion of the gospel. And Paul said to the churches of Galatia, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the gospel to another gospel, which is not the gospel, but some men would pervert the gospel of Christ. Oh, God, help me that I would never pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, Brother John Blevins is uh, laboring to provide clean drinking water for people in Africa, and that's a good thing because there's death in the water. There's typhoid, there's all other kinds of diseases in the water. And many people in the third world countries uh, suffer today because water is poisoned. Well, I want to tell you the gospel can be poisoned. You can have a lot of perversions in the gospel that will poison God's children. Do you all hear me this morning? It's our obligation to preach the same things that Paul preached to Timothy and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall what? Be able to teach others also. And what are they going to be teaching others also? The very things that Paul taught Timothy. How many chains in this link here this morning? There's five. Paul... Uh, Paul got it from Jesus. You know, Paul said, he said, <laughs> he said, the things I'm preaching to y'all, I got it by revelation from Jesus Christ. He didn't come up with it himself. So there's Jesus, and then there's Paul, and then there's Timothy, and then there's faithful witnesses, and then there are others that are to be teachers also. I want to say to you all this morning that I believe, and I know you may say, well, Brother Sam, it takes a lot of faith to believe what you're about to say. But we're to have faith in God, aren't we? We're to have great faith in God. I believe this gospel has been handed down for 20 centuries in the church just as it was handed down to Paul in the first century. I can't prove that with the writings of men, but I can prove that by the word of God. Now, there are people who have perverted the truth. I understand that. And, I, and, and you know, there are a lot of people in America today who say, well... You know, we just want to go to church, Brother Sam. We just want to go to church, place close to us, convenient. You know, where the kids can have a good time and, you know, and uh, whatever. Listen, 
I understand that. But a lot of people say, you know, we just, we don't want to be sticklers for the truth. We just don't want to get all tied up in doctrine. You know, years ago in Savannah, Georgia, I had a friend uh, whose husband was in our church, and she was into antiques. He had gotten into real estate after he got out of the military, 20 years in the military, and he had made some good money in real estate. And his wife wanted to buy a beautiful old house on Victory Drive. <laughs> and it was beautiful. I performed a wedding one time there in the front yard. It had those big old live oak trees, you know, three or 400 years old. It was beautiful. And this woman loved antiques. She loved them. And she didn't want anybody messing with her antiques. <laughs> and I could understand that. I'm not into antiques myself. Everything I ever had when I was a boy was antiques. <laughs> I'm not too excited about antiques. But I understand people that are. My wife loves them. Probably why she loves me. <laughs> but if you're into antiques, you don't want anybody messing with your antiques. Let's say, let's say that uh, George, you have a chair that belonged to George Washington. It actually sat there in Mount Vernon on the Potomac River. And George himself actually sat in that chair. And you got documented evidence. And you could buy that chair. I don't know what a chair like that would cost. This is just an illustration you all understand. But a chair like that, I imagine, <laughs> there ain't no telling what the antique world would want for a chair like that. Maybe a million dollars, I don't know. But if you got the antique chair and you started changing the chair, you'd be very foolish. Let's say you say, well, I just don't like the color of the chair, so you're going to change the color. <laughs> you don't like the upholstery, so you change the upholstery. You don't like the fact that it's a rocking chair, so you take the rockers off. Who would want that chair? <laughs> I mean, if it's an antique, you want to keep it like it is, don't you? Y'all get that. The antique world understands that. Well, in the church, we want to keep the doctrine as Jesus gave it to us. Is that being too hard? We want the practice of the church just like it was given to us in the, in, in the, in the lifetime of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we know a lot of things have changed that are, you know, uh, non-essentials like the building we meet in and the songbook we sing out of. But the doctrine and practice and discipline and uh, the government of the New Testament church should be kept like it was when Jesus Christ was on this earth. So, beloved, it's very important that we understand this. And we rejoice in it today. Now, you say, well, Brother Sam, if the church is not here to help God populate heaven, then uh, what is the purpose of the church? Well, I want to go back this morning to an Old Testament passage to shed some light on this New Testament truth. I want to go back with you to Psalm 84, where the psalmist is writing to us about how precious the house of God was to him. Let's go back to Psalm 84 and beginning in verse 1. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. He's speaking highly of the tabernacle of God. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for what? For the living God. Now here is the psalmist describing to us how he values the temple and how he values the living God who has promised to meet with them in the temple. Then notice, if you will, in verse 3, the psalmist says, Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. What is that talking about? What is the sparrow and the swallow? What do they have to do with the house of God? Well, I believe the psalmist, whoever wrote this, probably David, being near the house of God, would see the sparrows and the swallows. 
How many of y'all love to watch birds? We have a bird feeder on our back porch and a bird bath. And I just tell you, they, they preach to me every day. I love watching birds. I enjoy that. Well, the psalmist was observing the sparrows and the swallows. And apparently they were building their nest up high in the temple around the columns. Have you ever seen a bird building a nest high up? Now, what the psalmist is saying is this. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, <laughs> and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. And what the psalmist, I think, is saying is this. Just as the sparrow and the swallow has found a place of rest and a place of safety in the house of God, he says, my soul longs for that. My soul longs for a safe place in this troubled, broken, miserable, mixed up world. Listen to what he says. He says in verse 4, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee, Selah. Now, God provided for Israel in the Old Testament a tabernacle and later a temple in Jerusalem. And it was to be a place of worship, a place of safety, a place of refuge that the Israelites could travel and visit and be a part of. But it's my personal conviction that the church of Jesus Christ in the world today in the New Testament is for us what the temple was for them in the Old Testament. And the church today is not identified with a certain geographical location or a building. But let me tell you, it is a place of rest and a place of safety. Just as the sparrow and the, and the, and the swallow could find a nest where they could be safe. So David was wanting a place for his own soul to be, a, to be at rest. He says... Um, my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Let me tell you, if you've ever been born of the Holy Spirit and you've got a new nature in you, you long for this place. You long for the hymns of Zion. You hunger for the Word of God. You long for the fellowship of the saints. There's some part of you, some nature in you that cannot be satisfied anywhere else but in the house of God. For the living God. It's okay to go to sports events or concerts or whatever. You know, that's, that's fine. Political rallies. Thank God they're over for a while. <laughs> it's okay to go to something like that. But I can tell you right now, it's not going to satisfy the longing of your soul. You want to be in a place where His name is exalted and magnified. Where He gets all the glory. We don't share it with anybody else. From age to age, he's the same, right? And in this place, we're not trying to update it or remodel it. You know, <laughs> back in the 1500s, they, caught, they claimed the church was uh, reformed. I want to tell you, the church of Jesus Christ never did need to be reformed. It certainly didn't need to be resurrected. Now, it needs to be revived. <laughs> and we can all use revival on a daily basis, right? I heard about a preacher one time, he went to hold a week's meeting at a church, and uh, on the fifth night of the meeting, he left and he said, what this church, they'd called him to preach a revival, and he said, this church doesn't need to be revived, this church needs to be resurrected. <laughs> they were dead. We don't want to be a dead church, do we? We don't want to be a carnal, cold a lukewarm church. We want to be a church that loves God and loves one another. And it's all about worshiping Him and giving Him the glory in His house. Amen. How important that is. And that's what I think David is saying. And, and when you uh, internalize that for the New Testament today, I, listen now to what the, the psalmist says. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them. Who pass, I was talking to a lady this week who was, um, she was, uh, uh, she worked for lawyers and she was a legal, a paralegal. And she worked in this office for years here in Birmingham and, 
And she said, uh, Pastor, she said, when I got out of that office, I was so happy. I said, why? She said, because while I was there in the office, there was so much competition and so much backbiting and, and people running one another down. And, uh, and, and, and she said it was just horrible. And, and during the coffee breaks, it was always gossiping, gossiping, gossiping. Now listen, not every office is that way. Not every business is that way. But there's a lot of that goes on out there in the world. Let's make sure that doesn't happen at Vestavia Primitive Baptist Church, right? We love one another here. We want to encourage one another. We want to edify one another. Why? How? By pointing one another to God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And singing the old hymns and the spiritual songs that magnify Him and feed the soul. <laughs> oh, brothers and sisters... How we need a safe place in this troubled world. Now listen to what the psalmist says. He said, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. Baca was a place of tears. It was a place of sorrow. It was a place of difficulty. And all of us on this earth are going to go through those valleys of Baca. Somebody said to me one time years ago, and I didn't comprehend it at the time, but they said you're either, you're either coming out of a problem in your life, or you're right in the middle of a problem, or you're about to go into one. That's life, isn't it? The book Job says, Job, Job made this statement, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Life is hard down here on this earth. I'm constantly talking to people that have lost their loved one. Or their hearts have been broken because of infidelity. Or there's sickness that's invaded the home. And, and there's trouble, financial problems, people losing their jobs. Yes, it's hard down here on this earth. But notice what the psalmist says. Who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. <laughs> in other words, they find refreshment and strength there. And instead of us becoming victims in our problems and trials, why don't we become victors in Jesus Christ? And instead of being professional victims, let's be students and learn as we're passing through our trials and our tribulations. Amen? We don't want to be victims. I don't want to be a professional victim. We could sit around here all day long and compare wounds and scars. We've all got them. But let's forget them and put our faith in God. And look for the future and, and, and make a well out of our valley of Baca. Where we can get strength for our lives on this earth. Now, let's go on and... <laughs> I don't, want to, I, want, I don't uh, have the time this morning to go into all the psalm. But listen to what he says in verse 10. For a day in thy courts, listen to this, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. A thousand days would be what, almost three years? David is saying one day in your house would be more valuable to me than... Than three years anywhere else. I love that. At my age, I want to tell you, <laughs> that's precious. One day in God's house. You say, I just don't get anything out of church. God bless you. <laughs> you, need, you need to get plugged in. Because you say, well, I just don't get anything out of church. Anymore. I like what John Kennedy said one time. He said, don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. That's a good attitude to have toward the church, isn't it? Don't, don't come here and, and just to be receiving, 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 receiving all the time. Be giving, giving, giving. Reach out. Tell others the good news. Visit the sick. Use the talents God has given you to be a blessing in this world. You know, the Dead Sea was dead because it was a reservoir. It just collected water from the Jordan River and it was dead. Nothing could live there. Don't be a dead sea. Be a pipe where things just run through you and bless others in this world. Amen? Are y'all getting this today? Are you enjoying your life? If you're not, you need to just start helping other people. I wish I could preach this like I see it. One day in God's house 
is better than a thousand beside. I tell you, the triumphs and victories and successes of this world can leave an aching void in you. But when you're full of God and the Holy Spirit and the truth, there's a contentment that passes knowledge. Now notice what David says. For uh, he said, I'd rather, <laughs> I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Do y'all get that? A doorkeeper. What's a doorkeeper? Brother Mark's our doorkeeper. <laughs> he volunteered. He greets people when they're coming in. I'm, I'm glad he does that. He does a good job. <laughs> a doorkeeper. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to be a big shot out there in the world. Wow. <laughs> Y'all getting this? I want to tell you, the church is a precious place on this earth. And may God help us. You say, well, Brother Sam, I, I wouldn't mind being in the church, but, but I, I'm a free spirit. I just want to live my life the way I want to live it. I know there's a God, and I'm glad Jesus died for me, but, but I don't want to be tied down. <laughs> I want to be a free spirit. Now, you need to tell me what you mean by that term, free spirit. You know, we do need to define our terms. If you mean by free spirit, I want to be free to get drunk every Saturday night. <laughs> And I want to be free to fornicate, and I want to be free to, you know, to do this and do that and the other. Then you don't, be, you don't need to be in the church. Because Jesus said this. He said, if you want to follow me, he didn't say pick up your golf club and your tennis racket. That's okay to play tennis and golf and basketball and baseball. But if you're going to follow me, Jesus says, deny yourself. Now, that's not a popular message in America. <laughs> Deny yourself. Somebody sent me a text the other day about 18-year-old boys having, needing therapy, psychotherapy, because somebody was hurting their feelings. And in 1944, 18-year-old boys were invading Normandy, knowing sure death waited for multitudes of them. We need to grow up, folks, and deny ourselves. Living is not putting yourself first. You heard it from me. You heard it right here in the Word of God. Deny yourself and take up your what? Your cross. And what does the cross symbolize? It, it symbolizes sacrifice and suffering. Jesus picked up his cross. May God help me to pick up mine. And then Jesus said, follow me. If you want to be a part of the church, you, you're not going to be a free spirit and out here living like you want to live. You're going to have to do it Jesus' way. But I, I don't know of anybody, and I've been in the church over 50 years, and I've known a lot of people in the church, and I have yet to meet anybody who says, Brother Sam, I just wish I'd have never joined the church. <laughs> it just wrecked my life. I never have heard that. And so if you love the Lord and you love the church and you want help, listen, we're living in a crazy world. I'm telling you, we're living in a crazy world. People are so confused in their minds. The Supreme Court has been doing things that's been crazy. In this country, they don't even know where life begins. Isn't that sad? They think you can take the life of a baby right up till the day it's to be born. And it's not a life. I don't want to get into all the craziness that's in this world. But brothers and sisters, if you want to keep a sound mind, you need to be in a good church where they're teaching you the Word of God and they're not scared to teach it. And we're not politically correct. We want to be loving and kind. And I want to say this about the church. You say, well, Brother Sam, I'm not good enough for the church. Well, none of us were. None of us were good enough for the church. The church is like a hospital for the sick and the broken and the troubled and the wounded can come for help. But you don't, get in, you don't go to a hospital to get worse. <laughs> you go to a hospital to get better. And the church is here to help all of us live better lives. What I want for every child in this church I want to tell you, I, I've been here 12 years. I've learned to love you all. I love, I love every child in this church. 
I'll tell you why I was so concerned about this past election. Not for me. I've lived the good life. I'm concerned about our children. I got a grandchild coming the last of November. Well, Jeff's got one on the way. What do we want our children and grandchildren to be born into? We'd like for it to be a God-fearing, old-time, flag-waving America, wouldn't we? But we can't go out there and change the world. But what we can do is keep the world from changing us. And so if, you, if you're looking for peace and joy and happiness, the church is not going to rob you of that. The church is not for old folks. It's for everybody that loves God and looking for the good life. Jesus, I am come that you might have life, comma, and that you might have it more abundantly. The life is eternal life. And then there's a comma. And then there's that abundant life that comes through discipleship. Which side of that comma are you on today? Are you listening? Are you enjoying the abundant life? Thank you all for your wonderful attention today. Uh, do we have a selection? Yes. What number?